coups kill and they ruin countries. And so we are here um, to pay tribute to the people around the world and in our own countries uh, whose lives have been deeply affected by the US Cold War. This is our second Cold War Truth Commission, obviously the largest, amazing. Um, our first was in 2017, we did it in Los Angeles. And um, some of the speakers here today were also um, speakers at that event. And I wanna read a little language that we used at that first event to put this in context. Are you now, or have you ever been, discounted and ridiculed for your ideals and activism, or called a red or a communist or a socialist, in order to intimidate and discredit your ideas or your solutions to today's domestic or international problems? You are not alone. In fact, you are part of a 150-year-long drama of U.S. red baiting, illegality, and anti-communist hysteria. A history that, if understood, can help us unravel and understand both today's domestic and international events. Our mission statement is that we consider the U.S. Cold War to be our nation's third and as of yet unrecognized crime. After the genocide and land theft against Native Americans and the kidnapping and enslavement of African peoples. Our mission with the Cold War Truth Commission is to continue exposing U.S. illegal and immoral actions in the name of anti-communism at home and abroad. We seek to show how today's perverse violence and injustice, both at home and abroad, are intimately tied up to the perpetration of the U.S. Cold War, both historically and ongoing today. We believe that unraveling the web of lies and beginning a formal truth-telling on this issue will help the people in the U.S. and around the world understand. Without truth about the U.S. Cold War, there can be no true reconciliation for our times. The Cold War Truth Commission, because it was never recognized and because it is still happening. Now I'm going to uh, read what Blaise Pompeyne wrote uh, for the first Cold War Truth Commission three years ago. But before I do that, I want to tell you just a little about Blaze. He, he was a longtime anti-war peace and justice activist. He was a marinal priest in Guatemala until he was kicked out of the country for refusing to support the CIA and what they were doing to the poor people there. Blaze and his wife, Teresa, founded their group, The Office of the Americas, in 1983. Blaze hosted his show on KPFK called World Focus for something like 40 years and Half of the people speaking today probably were on Blaze's show. And uh, he was a mentor to so many of us in Southern California and all across the country. Blaze passed away two years ago. Well over a thousand people came to his memorial. He was so well loved and respected. Um, and I wanna just finish about Blaze. He always said that he did his anti-war work because he wanted to stop his country, the United States, from killing millions of innocent people all over the world. Blaze Pompeian, Presente. And I'm going to read what Blaze wrote three years ago for the Cold War Truth Commission. <clears throat> the Cold War was an attempt to continue the military industrial windfall profits of World War II. The Cold War was followed by a long era of profit without useful production. Millions of innocent civilians were murdered simply for being called communists. The word communist could be simply translated as okay to kill. In the past 28 years, the word communist has been replaced by the word terrorist. Our nation conducts a war of terror primarily against civilians. The commercial media silence in the United States during our current devastation of Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Somalia, and Pakistan, together with the immediate threat of biocide by thermonuclear weapons is outdoing the demonic holocaust of the Third Reich. Silence is complicity Blaise Pompeii, PhD. Um, so we have another testimony uh, and that will be from Carly Town. Hey, Carly. Carly Hi. is the co-director of Code Pink and coordinates the Defund the Pentagon program. Thank you, Carly. 
Thank you, Rachel, and thanks everyone um, for being here this afternoon or this evening, wherever you are. Um, and you know, I just want to go ahead and share my screen screen quickly. Um, thanks so much for that wonderful introduction, and, and good to see you as well, Chris. Um, so as, as Rachel said, my name is Carly Town. I'm co-director of Code Pink. Um, I work on our Divest from the War Machine campaign, which works to divest our schools, our cities, our politicians, and other financial institutions from the War Machine. Um, I want to thank everyone again for putting on this amazing event. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about an important legacy of the Cold War, um, which is military spending. Um, so with that, I want to talk about um, current levels of US military spending in the United States. I think this is a really important graphic. I'm sure many people here has, have seen it, but important to show, right? It means that right now the United States spends more than the next 10 nations combined on our Pentagon budget. You can see that there. Um, some important things about this. Um, it's important to note that the category of quote unquote defense in budget accounting doesn't include programs that would probably be classified as part of spending on national security. So most obviously, right, those are separate accounts for the Department of Homeland Security, um, the Department of Veterans Affairs. So when we look at a graphic like this and you see that number, it's important to understand that doesn't even capture the entirety of US spending on militarized programs within the United States. Okay, so we see how much more we spend on the Pentagon budget compared to other countries, right? So I wanted to explore a little bit about the Pentagon budget a little more. So in 2021, right, the Pentagon budget is $740 billion, which means if we break that down, we'll spend over a million dollars a minute on the Pentagon in 2021. So by the time I'm done with this presentation, probably $10 million. Half of that budget will go directly to private quote unquote defense contractors, including weapons companies like Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, which represents a huge increase in spending on private defense contractors um, since 2001 alone. So that's, that's the Pentagon budget today. We dedicate so much of the Pentagon budget to creating and maintaining weapons that the US military sends quote unquote excess military grid weaponry to local police forces through something called the 1033 program. And the 1033 program was created in the 1990s during the, the quote unquote war on drugs and has since transferred over $7.4 billion that we know of in excess property, including weapons to local police forces. And you see that photo there um, is from a protest from this summer um, in, in Miami. Um, where a police officer watches from an armored vehicle. So, you know, I think that these numbers are shocking, right? And at the end of the day, really demonstrate what our real priorities are as a nation. Um, and, you know, it's, it's important to put them into a broader context, right? When I say $740 billion on the Pentagon budget, you know, you can see here just 10% of that could help end um, homelessness in the United States, right? Something Chris was mentioning. 20% of that could make public college tuition free for two years. 50% of the Pentagon budget could end world hunger by 2030, right? So within that context, it's really important to understand how do we get to this point where our budget priorities are so skewed, right? And today, right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we can't talk about our current military spending without understanding it as part of the many legacies of the Cold War, right? This is really, really important. So I wanna show people here um, another graph. This one um, shows us more of a timeline of our spending on national defense over the years. Um, so, you know, many current discussions about the US military budget begin around the early 2000s, right? During the beginning of the so-called war on terror. Um, you'll see that, uh, first pink um, uh, arrow there pointing to that. But if we take uh, defense spending historically in a, in a broader context, current spending on defense and nuclear weapons, um, nuclear weapons, the latter um, is under the auspices of the Department of Energy, actually exceeds levels during the Korean War, the Vietnam War, um, and the Reagan buildup in, in the 1980s, which I also pointed out in the graph there with that pink arrow. 
Um, but also we need to understand that US nuclear capability um, has primarily been motivated by and justified by um, right after World War II, a parallel buildup um, in the Soviet Union. The Vietnam War was often justified by reference to the domino theory that through Vietnam, of course, right, communism was spread to the rest of Southeast Asia. That was the domino theory. And after the end of World War II, if you go to the final um, arrow there, you can see a sharp increase in military spending, which has not dipped below spending levels in the post-war period of the 1950s since, right? So while we see a, a large uptick in military spending um, during the so-called war on terror, you have to look back historically to see when this large uptick in military spending really started and has since not dipped below, right? So that's really important. Another thing that's an important legacy of the Cold War um, show is from the cost of war data, which shows a similar trajectory. So on the screen, you actually see um, an animated photo, which is showing you um, over the years, the number of US military bases abroad. And again, that the United States has been the world's dominant military power since the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War. Um, U.S. military bases around the world, of course, right, really serve as a physical testament to the legacy of U.S. military buildup um, during and, and, and after the Cold War. So I think this is another really important legacy that we have to remember when we talk about current levels of Pentagon spending to put it into that historical context. So all of this, I think, can be um, a little bit overwhelming. Understanding the enormity of the Pentagon budget can really feel that way. Um, but I think it's also important for us today to recognize that the tide is turning. Um, you know, we're officially a little over one year into a really devastating public health crisis um, that is really wreaking havoc on the lives of million, millions of people across the globe and in the United States. Um, and many people are really waking up to the fact that we can't continue the failed strategy of pouring hundreds of billions into the Pentagon budget while we underfund things like public health programs, the Green New Deal, that sort of thing, right? And I think this tweet from uh, Cori Bush uh, is, is excellent to remind yourself that um, the tide is turning on the conversation around the Pentagon budget. Um, so I also just wanted to end with a quick, what can we do, right? It's not, not all doom and gloom. So a recent study from the Security Policy Reform Institute found a direct correlation between contributions from the defense industry and voting to maintain or increase military spending, right? We all know that that link is there, but there's a study now showing that. And at Code Pink, we're calling on everyone to reach out to their congressional representatives to sign the Code Pink pledge to commit to stop taking campaign contributions from weapons companies. So you can see the pledge here. We're asking people to commit to refuse money from weapons makers. It's a very simple pledge. It's a really great way to start talking to your local congressional representative. And if they say no, that they're unwilling to stop taking campaign contributions from weapons makers, that's a really important piece of information for you and, and for activists in your area. Why is it that your congressional representative won't um, commit to stop taking uh, money from weapons makers? And we have a list of some of the folks that we've already asked to sign on um, who have agreed. Um, I'll leave this on the screen for a couple of seconds here and you know, make sure you ask yourself, has your representative signed our pledge to stop taking campaign contributions? from weapons manufacturers. And if they haven't, right, it's really important that they do. And I posted a link which takes you to it. Um, I also wanted to mention, you know, the importance of this pledge. Uh, the Security Policy Reform Institute also recently did a study of every Congress member who has signed our pledge to divest from war, who has also voted unanimously to move funds from the Pentagon to the people. Right, so this is again a really important tool um, that I'd love for people to uh, check out. And last thing before I, I wrap up, um, having your congressional representative sign our pledge to stop taking campaign contributions from weapons companies is really important for a step. We also need to show our politicians that we have concrete ways they can reduce the Pentagon budget and invest in our local communities, which is why we have a Code Pink Guide to Pentagon Cuts. 
when you go to that website, you'll see the specific cuts that we're asking our representatives to make. It's a way to also educate them about what actually is contained within the Pentagon budget. As I said, it's, it's enormous. And even our congressional representatives don't know what's inside. So I just wanted to end with a way to, for people to take action um, today. And with that, I wanna thank everyone for a really excellent um, event. And I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen now. So much. Thank you, Carly. And we will have testimony now. Um, and Frank will introduce our next speaker. All right, thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Carly. Uh, Bruce Gagna is the coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. He's been working on space issues since 1982. He's the Vietnam War era veteran, and he's a member of Veteran for Peace, and he's a great, a great guy. Bruce Gagnon. Thank you, Frank. Great to be with everyone. I want to uh, thank Chris for his words about Ronald Reagan. It reminds me of a story that in the early 80s, I was living in Orlando, Florida, and Reagan came to make his famous Russia evil people speech at a big hotel. And I organized a protest outside of that speech. In that uh, particular speech, Reagan said that Russia was the epitome of evil in the world. And it reminds me of what Biden said just in the last few days that Vladimir Putin had no soul. And so it really, I think, underscores dramatically how things haven't changed that much, if any at all, in, in regard to the US demonization of Russia. I wanna start talking about space, uh, taking us back to World War II at the time of the end of the war, when the US uh, military created a secret program called Operation Paperclip and smuggled 1,500 top Nazi op operatives, uh, Hitler's uh, uh, generals and scientists and all different kinds of people, uh, intelligence people uh, to the US. And they, throughout the military industrial complex, these Nazis were seeded. And 100 of these people were uh, Werner von Braun and the rocket team that created the V-1 and V-2 rockets that Hitler used to terrorize the cities of London and Paris and Brussels near the end of World War II. One of these people that came along with von Braun was Major General Walter Dornberger, who was Hitler's liaison uh, to the rocket team. So his job was to make sure that von Braun had everything he needed, and he reported back to Hitler on the progress of this rocket operation. And so when they came to the US, they brought 100 copies of the V-2 rocket to Huntsville, Alabama, to the Army's Redstone Arsenal, to begin working on creating the US space program. And Major General Walter Dornberger, Hitler's liaison, became vice president of Bell Aerospace in New York. Uh, in the 1950s, Dornberger testified before the Congress of the United States, where he said, gentlemen, I didn't come to this country to lose the Third World War. I lost two already. And he went on to lay out his vision for the future with orbiting battle stations in space that would be used to determine who could get on and off the planet Earth. I call it the Nazi prophecy. Well, in the uh, late uh, 1990s, the US Space Command created this document called Vision for 2020. And in here, they talked about how the United States would control space, dominate space, and deny other nations access to space when necessary. And in fact, at the Space Command headquarters in Colorado Springs, at Peterson Air Force Base, above their doorway, the logo Master of Space is emblazoned there, something that they wear uh, as a patch on their uniform as well. So this is the, I would say, Nazi prophecy that's come to fruition in the current moment. Uh, earlier, Alice Slater mentioned uh, the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, that George W. Bush pulled out of in 2002. This kept 
the mutually assured destruction, MAD, sort of uh, in, in, a, in a kind of weird way, it, it, uh, MAD created some stability because neither side had a, a real advantage over the other. There was this rough equivalency between nuclear forces. The ABM Treaty blocked this idea of having a shield to be used after you launched a first strike attack on another country. But after the uh, US withdrawal of the ABM Treaty uh, during the Bush administration and then following during the Obama administration, the uh, uh, missile defense systems went on steroids being uh, tested and deployed encircling both Russia and China. And it was during that period, uh, during, especially during the Obama administration, where Russia and China kept repeatedly saying very publicly that we really can't get rid of our nuclear retaliatory capability because of uh, the uh, withdrawal from the ABM treaty. And now the deployments of these missile defense uh, forces, which are the shield to be used after a US first strike attack. It's important to remember that Russia and China have uh, long ago renounced first strike while the US refuses to do so, saying that we have to keep all options on the table. Today, uh, the United States has created a, a missile defense launch facility in Romania and they're building one in Poland right now. They will be able to launch these interceptors, the shield after a US first strike attack. And at the same time, these launch platforms have the capability to fire first strike, first strike attack Tomahawk cruise missiles, which are nuclear capable. And they would be able to reach Moscow in 10 minutes time from Romania and Poland. You've read nothing about this in the American media. I wonder why. But if Russia was to try to do something like this or China was to try to do something like this by putting similar capabilities in Mexico or Canada, the United States would go ballistic. Uh, at the end of the uh, Soviet Union, at the time of its collapse in 1991, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, Daddy Bush, was president, and his Secretary of State, uh, Jim Baker, promised Gorbachev that, that NATO would not expand one inch towards the Russian borders. And this was the agreement that was necessary to get Russia to agree to a unified Germany, both East and West Germany, coming back together again. But then when Clinton became president, he violated that promise and began uh, a major NATO expansion program that today is on steroids. And the uh, US and NATO are pressing right up against literally the Russian border. Now trying to get into Belarus, trying to get into Ukraine, trying to get into Georgia as well. In fact, NATO is going global as an alliance they're now setting up partnerships with countries, particularly in the Asia Pacific and in Latin America. And the idea is that NATO wants to replace the United Nations as the foremost international organization. Why? It was because at the, uh, at the UN Security Council, both Russia and China have the ability to veto resolutions brought by the US and NATO to declare war on particular countries. And so by creating an alternative alliance, which would be this expanded international NATO, uh, the United States would then be able to say, we have the backing of the world to go in and do these particular invasions in XYZ country. Recently, you all know that uh, during the Trump administration, Space Force was created. It's important to remember that at the time of this vote in the Congress, to authorize, to create the law, to create Space Force. The Democrats controlled the House of Representatives and could have blocked, could have killed Space Force right then and there. But the only thing the Democrats asked for was to instead call it the Space Corps rather than Space Force, making the name just a little more benign, a little nicer sounding. Uh, but that wasn't even passed. And so today we've got to ask, what is the mission? What is the job of the Space Force? And I would say it's two fundamental things. One is to give corporate 
capitalism control of the planet Earth. We know that with all space technology that exists today and the ground stations around the world that enable and, and uh, uh, beam on the satellites from uh, orbiting uh, uh, military satellites, uh, they beam the messages, the signals in real time, split second time. The Pentagon is able to see everything on the earth. It, 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 they're able to hear everything on the earth by intercepting all phone facts and email communications and ultimately target everything on the earth. So this document, Vision for 2020, talks about if we have control and domination of space, we will be able to win all the wars on planet Earth. So that's one job of the Space Force, is to put that in motion, is to create the technologies to make it possible. But secondly, there's another job, and that is to control what's called the Earth-Moon gravity well. Think of a wishing well. Imagine someone is down inside the bottom of a well and you're at the top. You have the advantage because of gravity. You can determine really whether they get out of that well or not. Well, it's the same way getting off the planet Earth. There is an Earth-Moon gravity well. And one of the things that Major General Walter Dornberger was talking about, the former Nazi, uh, when he talked to the Congress in the 1950s, when he said we need to have orbiting battle stations, he was talking about placing them at the top of the Earth-Moon gravity well so that the United States would be able to control which countries could go on and off the planet Earth. So today, as the United States, uh, during the Obama administration, passed a new law saying that uh, American individuals, American corporations can make land claims, can claim ownership of various planetary bodies, which would violate the UN's Outer Space Treaty and the, uh, and the Moon Treaty that say the, the planetary bodies are the province of all humankind. So the, now it's getting possible with technology development to be able to go out and mine the sky. And so we're seeing this privatization now of launch, uh, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, all kinds of other uh, private launch companies uh, now uh, getting contracts from the US to launch military satellites and, and this whole 5G explosion. They want to put uh, tens of thousands of satellites into space uh, orbiting the planet. So every single human being on the planet 24-7 would have a 5G satellite over their head. Uh, enabling them to uh, use these 5G systems that the Pentagon is saying are going to be instrumental in, in helping them develop major new weapon systems because of the speed of 5G. So 5G is really a military uh, operation. But anyway, this idea of mining the sky now is becoming quite popular. And so I think this is one of the drivers then of this goal to control the pathway on and off the planet to determine which country, which corporation, which individuals can go out and mine the heavens. And at the same time, the nuclear industry views space as a new market. They want to have nuclear powered mining colonies on the moon and Mars and other planetary bodies. And they want to have nuclear reactors on board rockets, cutting in half the amount of time it takes to get to Mars. Recently, I found out about a RAND Corporation study. You remember the RAND Corporation that uh, where uh, our friend Daniel Ellsberg was working during the Vietnam War, helping to write the government's secret history of the Vietnam War. He bravely smuggled out the, the, uh, the, this Pentagon Papers uh, to the New York Times and other newspapers around the country, broke the story open. Well, that was the RAND Corporation. But today they have a new study calling for the breakup or the balkanization of Russia into smaller constituent countries so that the oil corporations, the fossil fuel and resource extraction corporations would have a better job of controlling the Arctic region. Because of climate crisis and the melting of the Arctic ice, it's now going to be possible to drill, baby, drill in the Arctic. And these Western corporations look at a map and they see that Russia has the largest land border of any country on the planet with the Arctic. And so this must be changed. Thus, this RAND Corporation study. And thus, these 
current moves by US and NATO to have war games up in the Nordic region, right along the Russian border and Finland and Norway, Sweden and Denmark, all these particular parts of the world now are having uh, these war games. And the US is storing equipment in Norway, military hardware after these war games are over, they're stored at a weapons hub in Norway and also one in Poland as the war games are held in, the, in that part of Eastern Europe near the Russian border. They're storing these weapon systems in Poland for eventual use. So it's very clear to me that one of the major reasons for this constant demonization of Russia is to prepare the American people and the people throughout the West for this breakup, this balkanization of Russia so that the weapons corporations uh, can uh, take control uh, so that the oil corporations, resource extraction corporations can take control of the planet so that Wall Street will benefit from this uh, unipolar control of the planet. Right now with Russia and China and Iran and uh, Venezuela and Brazil and many other countries around the world rising, becoming competitors to the US global unipolar empire, the United States is desperate and freaking out and desperate people do desperate things. And so I think the US is as much a danger to the world as it's ever been, as it tries now to hang on to its place as this unipolar power, this unipolar empire of the world. And so I uh, want to really underscore and really thank Norman Solomon for his words, speaking directly to the peace movement here today, saying, stop buying this Russia demonization, this China demonization. Can't you see what the real agenda is? Don't believe it, don't follow it, and speak out against it. Uh, and uh, thank you all very much for listening. Good luck to everybody. Thank you. And Frank is going to introduce our next speaker giving <laughs> testimony. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Bruce, very much. Our next uh, testifier is David Vine. He's a professor of political anthropology at American University in Washington, D.C. And he's the author of a newly released book titled The United States of War, a global history of America's endless conflicts from Columbus to the Islamic State. David is also the author of the books Islands of Shame and Base Nation. And I'll just say, I found out about David when I heard him on Democracy Now! with Amy Gibbon sometime in the last year. And I looked him up and we've been communicating and I got his book and I'm glad to present him today. David, you're on. Thank you so much, Frank. And thank you to everyone who has helped put on this amazing Cold War Truth Commission. Um, thank you, especially to Rachel as well and to Code Pink. Of course, this is especially appropriate uh, being held the week of the 18th anniversary of the US invasion and war in Iraq. Uh, I, I have learned so much already. And I, I must say my commitment to my students and reading their papers is gonna be severely tested tonight um, as I debate between wanting to watch more and, and, and working on, on, on their work. I, I should say the, the truth is getting out. I hope if you didn't see the front page of the USA Today in just a few weeks ago, a reckoning is near. America has a vast overseas military empire. Does it still need it? This is the USA Today, the nation's newspaper. A reckoning is near. There's little I can say that hasn't been said already. Miguel Angel at the beginning, Rachel Frank, Gerald Horn, Carly Town, and many, many others have already shown us that there was nothing cold about the Cold War. If we just look at the deaths of the cold, so-called Cold War alone, among many other forms of destruction, I think we have to ask, how can we call this war cold, given that it killed three to four million people in Korea, an estimated 3.8 million in Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, half a million in a US-backed genocide in Indonesia, around a million in Afghanistan in the 1980s, 50,000 in Nicaragua, 75,000 in El Salvador, 200,000 in the Guatemalan genocide, among many others that I sadly don't have time to name. Calling the Cold War cold, of course, is so deeply troubling because it contributes to ignoring 
the many victims of the not Cold War, the dead, as well as the injured, the displaced, the traumatized, including victims here in the United States. I, just as a uh, quick aside, I, well, I don't think language choices are our most important political priority. I think we should continually call attention to the off offensive, really offensive inaccuracy of the name Cold War, and at least consider pushing uh, for, the, for a renaming of the war in the media and in history textbooks, among other places. Using the term so-called Cold War, I think is a good start. For now, I'll use the term the not Cold War. The main thing I wanna say today, echoing again what others have already said so powerfully, is that among the tens of millions of victims of the not Cold War, we should count the six Asian women, Asian American women, and two others murdered in last week's racist, misogynist massacre in Atlanta. Why should we consider them among the victims of the Cold War, the not Cold War? Because racism, of course, has fueled much of the US-led violence during and since the not Cold War in ways that in turn have further fueled racism, which in turn has fueled further war and violence to this day, including the massacre and for that matter, the January 6th coup attempt in Washington, DC. Perhaps put more simply and hopefully more clearly, racism has fueled US wars and other violence, which has fueled racism, which has fueled US wars and violence, which has fueled racism and so on in a repeating cycle. In a March 19th article in The Nation, Christine on Terry Park and Kathleen Richards show us the connections between rising anti-Asian violence across the country and quote, a long history of US foreign policy in Asia centered on domination and violence fueled by racism, unquote. I'm gonna quote from them at length because I think they demonstrate and explain these connections far better than I can. Belittling and dehumanizing Asians has helped justify endless wars and the expansion of US militarism. Christine Ahn, Terry Park, and Kathleen Richards write, and this has deadly consequences for Asians and Asian Americans, especially women. Anti-Asian violence through US foreign policy has manifested in the wars that have killed millions torn families apart and led to massive displacement in the nuclear tests and chemical weapons storage that resulted in environmental contamination in Okinawa, Guam, and the Marshall Islands and beyond, in the widespread use of napalm and Agent Orange in Vietnam, Laos, and Korea, in the US military bases that have destroyed villages and entire communities, in the violence perpetrated by US soldiers on Asian women's bodies, they continue, if we are to successfully stop anti-Asian hatred here in the United States, we must recognize how US foreign policy perpetuates it and end US militarism and wars throughout Asia Pacific. As we address violence against Asians and women and dismantle white supremacy at home, they say, we must also fundamentally re reorient US foreign policy in the Asia Pacific region and I'd add worldwide, away from domination and control and toward true human security for all. Building on the words of Christine Ahn, Terry Park and Kathleen Richards, let me close by saying that I hope today's event and last week's hor really horrific massacre inspire us to demand with new urgency this kind of fundamental transformation of US foreign policy. Demanding such change is not only the right and moral thing to do, it may be the only thing that saves us. Without such a transformation, the United States will likely continue to lurch from one racist war to the next, one white supremacist attack to the next, abroad and at home. As the nation's newspaper has said, and as last week's massacre demands, a reckoning is near. We must make it so. Thank you. David, thank you so much for your presentation.
I'd like to have you as a, a professor. <laughs> anyway, it's my honor now to, to introduce Kathy Kelly, um, who I've known for many years. She's a peace activist whose efforts have sometimes led to her living in war zone, uh, war zones and prisons. Believing where you stand determines what you see. Kathy and her companions have lived in war zones alongside ordinary people in Iraq, Afghanistan, Gaza, Lebanon, Bosnia, and Nicaragua. During the Cold War, she was arrested dozens of times for resisting U.S. intervention in Central America, was sentenced to one year in prison for nuclear disarmament action. She planted corn on a nuclear missile silo site and became a lifelong war tax refuser. And, um, I was at, with Kathy one year at the Fort Benning at the School of America's protest, and Kathy went through the fence down to Fort Benning. And I remember her, and Kathy's not a big person. <laughs> and they roughed her up really bad. The, the soldiers, the police roughed her up real bad. And Kathy asked them, why are, you, why are you doing this to me? I'm not resisting. And then she went to jail. But when Kathy goes to jail, she organizes. So anyway, I, I love you, Kathy. It's my honor to introduce Kathy Kelly, everybody. Well, hello, and thank you. Um, thank you, Frank, for that introduction. Thank you to everybody who has participated. What a um, important and crucial time it is to um, be receivers of this education and, of course, to be active. You know, um, Frank had written and said, please say something about Yemen. And so I, I want to start by saying that I was very surprised to see that the Saudi Kingdom, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has hired consulting companies well beyond Washington DC and New York in places like Maine and North Carolina, Des Moines, Iowa. And their strategy is to improve the image of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who has gone on Saudi TV to say that the long hideous war in Yemen is actually in their favor. They want to improve this image amongst people whom they're pretty sure really never heard of Yemen in the first place and who wouldn't really be troubled by the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Well, um, I think that's a signal to us of how important the work you're doing today is to be able to go out to the heartland and make sure people do know where Yemen is and what's happening in Yemen and that the people in Yemen are no threat whatsoever to people in the United States. Earlier, um, Daniel Ellsberg had talked about how the uh, annual subsidization of aerospace industry goes on in the United States and greatly benefits companies like Raytheon. He mentioned that uh, Raytheon now will have the contract to install new nuclear weapons, underground intercontinental ballistic nuclear weapons. And uh, these will bring enormous, enormous rewards financially to the Raytheon Corporation and other subsidiary groups. And uh, Daniel Ellsberg just kind of begged people, uh, don't let this happen. We should be organizing regionally to try and prevent it. And um, as Frank mentioned, I. Um, well, my first lengthy imprisonment, well, not lengthy compared to the hideous long sentences that are handed out to so many people, but I did spend a year in prison for planting corn on top of nuclear missile silo sites. And I think it is crucial for us to resist this ground-based defense or deterrent strategy that um, it is completely dependent on people believing that we should be afraid of Russia, we should be afraid of China, we have to enter into a new Cold War. And of course, what we actually so much need when the greatest terror we all face is the threat of what we're doing to our own environment, what we desperately need is an enhanced capacity to cooperate, to collaborate with Russia and with China, to be learning their languages, to be better understanding cultures to see what kinds of problems they mainly face, to see how scientifically we can join our resources and our abilities, and particularly not only facing climate catastrophe, but also a time of pandemic and with rising numbers of people fleeing from the various wars that we've started. So um, sort of as a, 
a, a tale that I think points us in a, 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 such a different direction. I want to speak briefly about people in a village in Yemen called Ahab. And these were people who were um, poor rural um, farmers, uh, herders, and they were in great troubles because they were running out of water. Their flocks were thirsting to death and they couldn't irrigate their crops. And so they did something that was risky, but so very uh, needed, uh, or, or they all might not survive. They pooled their resources and they collectively hired a, a rig so that they could dig and dig down deeper into the earth and hope to hit water. Well, they weren't successful at first and it got to be uh, very, very agonizing. They thought, well, we've you know, given money we didn't have or borrowed money. Now we're going to find out that this was a wasted project or maybe we've been uh, conned by an unfair group. Anyway, one night, finally, they hit water and it was like Eureka. They had a wonderful celebration. People danced and they sang into the wee hours of the morning. And as they were sort of heading back to their homes, um, well, some had heard that the Saudis were in the habit of bombing wells in Yemen. But they thought, well, we're so removed from any place that's strategic or crucial, nobody's going to waste a bomb on us, but they were wrong. Coming from Arizona, a Raytheon manufactured bomb was dropped by a Saudi pilot. It dangled in the air on a fuse. And then when that fuse is cut, three fins sprout out, the bomb comes to life. And that bomb hurtled down to exactly where those people celebrating having collectively found water had been heading back home. And immediately when the bomb's nose count hits the ground, then that releases two tons of explosives. The shards of the bomb travel eight times the speed of light. If such a shard were to hit your body, you could be disemboweled, you could be decapitated, your limbs could be cut off from your torso. And this is what happened to the revelers who were celebrating having hit water. Jeffrey Stern asked with people uh, what, he'd what the bomb had done to them. He spoke with a particular man who took his hand and put his hand on his cheek. And Jeffrey Stern felt the presence of metal in the man's cheekbone and in his forehead. And he said it was an amazing thing to have traveled from Arizona to Point us collectively toward working constantly to put an end to war, to wean ourselves out of the military industrial congressional media complex, and to find ways to deal with the real terrors we face, the terror of what we're doing to our own environment. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, so much. Um, okay, we're someone's freezing sometimes. Um, uh, our next testifier will be um, David Swanson. And David Swanson is an author, activist, journalist, and radio host. He is executive director of World Beyond War and campaign coordinator for Roots Action. Swanson's books include War is a Lie, When the World Outlawed War, and others. Welcome, David. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and share screen if that's okay. Uh, the Cold War did not have a hard and fast beginning that transformed the world or that turned heroic anti-Nazi Soviets into satanic commies on a particular afternoon. The rise of Nazism had been facilitated in part by Western government's pre-existing enmity for the USSR. That same enmity was a factor in the delay of D-Day by two and a half years. The destruction of Dresden was a message originally scheduled for the same day as the meeting at Yalta. 
Upon victory in Europe, Churchill proposed using Nazi troops together with allied troops to attack the Soviet Union. It was not an off the cuff proposal. The US and UK had sought and achieved partial German surrenders, had kept German troops armed and ready, and had debriefed German commanders. General George Patton, Hitler's replacement, Admiral Karl Donitz and Alan Dulles favored immediate hot war. The US and UK violated their agreements with the USSR and arranged new right-wing governments with bans on the leftists who had fought the Nazis in places like Italy and Greece and France. The destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was in part a message to the USSR. Among the deep and horrible flaws one can attribute to the USSR, starting the Cold War is not one of them. The US could have chosen hot war, but could also have chosen peace. But the Cold War was not carefully and deliberately arrived at as a wise policy over a period of time. The worst president the United States has ever had, Harry Truman, advanced it in 1945 and announced its rapid expansion as an urgent necessity in 1947, laying out a doctrine that soon established a major permanent military industrial complex, the CIA, the NSC, the Federal Employee Loyalty Program, NATO, a permanent empire of bases, the upsurge in US-backed coups, the permanent taxation of working people for a permanent war budget, and mass massive nuclear stockpiles, all of which, with some variations, are still with us. The general pattern during the Cold War was one of the US leading the USSR in weapons and driving the arms race while pretending to be losing it as a justification for escalation. Much of the US propaganda was the work of former Nazis in the US military, those folks Bruce was talking about a minute ago. Many of the particular lies are still used in variation today. The missile gaps, the domino effects, the reborn Hitlers everywhere. Major Cold War themes so control common thinking as to be hardly visible, they include the idea that the United States should dominate the globe. The idea that shortcomings within a foreign country are grounds for bombing its people. And if you think anti-Asian hatred is mysterious, imagine how confused you'd be if people who consume US media were able to imagine they could recognize people of Russian ancestry. Or the idea that progressive reforms in the United States should be blocked if they can be associated with a foreign enemy. The Cold War was not just foreign policy. Nothing has done more to make the US public the worst off wealthy nation on earth. Or the idea that government secrecy and surveillance are justified. The Cold War created the habit of living with the risk of apocalypse and conditioned people through their survival over what they imagined to be a long period of time to think the threat was overblown. Many of them assume the climate threat is overblown too. The notion that the Cold War had something to do with democracy was addressed by Lyndon Johnson to the Greek ambassador to the United States when he said, quote, Fuck your parliament and your constitution. America is an elephant. Cyprus is a flea. If these two fleas continue itching the elephant, they may just get whacked by the elephant's trunk and whacked good. The most important fact about the Cold War is its incredible stupidity. Building weapons to destroy the earth numerous times over while hiding under school desks and backyards should be viewed as roughly as sensible as burning witches. The second most important fact about the Cold War is that it was not cold. While wealthy nations have not fought each other, the proxy wars and wars on poor nations and coups have killed millions and have never let up. The US in 2021 arms, trains, and or funds the militaries of 48 of the 50 most oppressive governments on earth with no need of a communist threat to justify it. It's normal now. The third most important fact about the Cold War is that it was not won by militarism. The USSR was damaged by its militarism and dismantled by nonviolent activism, but the US was deeply damaged too. The nuclear danger is now greater than ever. The proximity between parties in Eastern Europe is greater and the ridiculous claims are more firmly than ever a matter of faith. 
Pentagon officials admit to the media that they're lying about Russia or China to sell weapons and maintain bureaucracies, yet nothing changes. Russiagate depicted a US president engaged in numerous acts of hostility toward Russia as secretly a servant of the Russian president. In many countries, a major effort would have been needed to get people to believe such a thing, not in post-Cold War United States. That US academics can sit through two decades of devastating US wars on Western and Central Asia and then hysterically denounce the public referendum in Crimea to rejoin Russia as the greatest threat to the peaceful world order in modern times is a product of the Cold War. Wildly exaggerated and distorted tales about China and the Uyghurs, not to mention Hillary Clinton's claiming of the entire Pacific is a product of the Cold War. When Biden called Putin a killer and Putin wished Biden good health, the New Yorker informed me that Putin's comment was clearly a threat. That is a product of the Cold War. There were serious scholars who believed that when the USSR ended, so would US militarism. Earlier, others had believed the same about the end of the wars on the Native Americans. But the mad drive to dominate everyone and the corruption of the weapons business will not end because a particular sales pitch ends. New spins will be found and old standbys revived until benevolent imperialism is simply normal. There is, sadly, vastly more evidence that the United States Senate hates you and wants you to suffer than there is that Russia or China does. The war business is an uncontrollable monster, it creates the nuclear risk, destroys civil liberties, destroys self-governance, fuels bigotry, devastates the natural environment and climate, and kills first and foremost by diverting resources into war and away from human and environmental needs, or what Dr. King called programs of social uplift, but which we're all most familiar with under the name socialism, or its earlier variation, godless commie evil. So don't let them misdirect your anger. Stay energized, but stay focused on the right targets. Thanks for including me here. Great presentation, David. Excellent.